Hello, everyone. And uh, welcome to uh, this 18th webinar of our webinar series. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, uh, today, we will hear from academic and industry experts on how to understand value, how to capture the owners and users strategic objectives towards uh, an optimized creation and enhancement of economic, social, and environmental value uh, within the construction industry. My name is Karima Hamani, and I am the academic lead uh, for knowledge exchange at CESC. First, we would like to acknowledge our uh, CISC six uh, CESC partners, industry partners, who have been integral to the development of the center and our engagement with industry. We would like also to acknowledge our ongoing collaboration with our affiliates and strategic alliance partners. So uh, in today's event, the, the webinar will, be, will last up to 60 minutes, and it will include a presentation followed by a panel discussion. We encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A Q box uh, throughout the event, and our panel will address them during the Q&A session. Please note that we are recording this webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed industry and academic experts. Uh, the webinar will be moderated by uh, Riaz Kazi. He's uh, a program and project, project and commercial management practice lead at Mott McDonald Middle East. Our presenter today is Dr. Graham Bowles, Associate Professor at Harriet Watt University and Program Lead for MSc in Construction Management and Quantity Surveying at our Edinburgh campus. Uh, we are also joined by uh, uh, Darren Dankiewicz, uh, Director of uh, Energy and Engineering, JLL MENA. And uh, of course, last but not least, we will be also uh, joined by Ihan Turgul, uh, Turgul, who is the general manager at CARES. Uh, of course, for the details uh, or detailed bios for our speakers, please refer to the webinar invites that you use to register for this event and, of course, to their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, I will now hand over to our moderator, Riaz Kazi. Over to you, Riaz. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karima. Um, so this is a very huge topic and we've, as Dr. Prima has mentioned, we only have a very short time to talk about this. Um, the topic, just as a reminder, a whole life cycle approach to value creation and construction. Um, and I was speaking to the delegates previous just to, to us commencing this session. Actually, we could spend an hour talking about each subset of this topic because it's that big. Um, what we wanted to try and look at in this topic is actually, you know, understanding the client's strategic objectives and how you translate them into functional projects. Um, when you understand that actually value creation could mean many things to different people, um, you really need to understand what it means and to try and achieve the stakeholder satisfaction as you go through a project lifecycle. And that needs a whole lifecycle approach. Um, I, I feel this is a very important topic, particularly given the recent energy rises and the costs that we're seeing globally. Um, and, you know, we're seeing pandemics happening and we need to consider other, other factors such as sustainable development goals, uh, the impact on carbon and net zero, and also the wider social value impact. Um, so that's a brief introduction to what the topic is. Um, before I hand over to Dr. Graham, uh, who's going to be presenting, I'd just like to mention, you know, to reiterate what Dr. Karima has said, and that is if you have any questions throughout at any point in time, please go through to the Q&A box and put questions in, and I'll be picking them up um, towards the end so that we can have uh, an open discussion with the panelists. Over to you, Dr. Graham. Okay, thank you, Riaz, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, greetings from 
Edinburgh campus. It's a pleasure to, to join you this afternoon. The sun is almost shining and it's about 14 degrees, so it's summer um, and feels like it in Scotland. So anyway, it's my pleasure to talk about the, the, the subject, a whole life cycle approach to value creation in construction. And I'm going to spend about 15 minutes giving a fairly broad overview. Um, and this reflects some of my views and understandings based on fairly long uh, teaching and research career. Um, and as the slide shows, I am the project program leader for the Masters in Construction Project Management and Commercial Management and Quantity Surveying at the Edinburgh campus. So my areas of teaching to undergraduate and postgraduate students are around uh, cost, value, uh, and risk. And that informs what I'm going to be sort of sharing with you um, this afternoon. Uh, and just on this first slide, I've got a, a kind of useful way to express value through a simple ratio or a set of simple ratios that we use with the students to get them to think about what value means. Um, as the discussion progresses, we'll consider the difficulty in actually defining what value means and how it differs from different perspectives relating to projects and construction projects. And it's really important to, to explore these and understand these from the point of view of the client and the sponsor in particular at the outset of a project. But of course, this permeates through the whole supply chain um, and getting to the end result, the delivery of the project. So within our subjects that we, we teach at both Dubai campus and Edinburgh campus and also Malaysia campus, where these programs are, are delivered, um, we talk a lot about value engineering, value management. Uh, we talk a lot about function, function analysis, and improving functionality as a means to promoting value in projects. So this ratio expresses how we can improve value by a number of ways. We can reduce costs in projects that we deliver and maintain functionality. We can improve the project, improve functionality at a consistent cost, provide better products, better systems for the same, the same the price to the client. We can do something completely different. We can innovate. And this is the ideal value ratio is improve performance, improve functionality at a lower cost. And that demands a, a rethink about how we, um, how we approach projects. It's, it's more radical than simple cost saving and you know, doing what we already do, but a little bit more efficiently. Or we can improve functionality. We can convince clients to spend a little more to get a significant increase in performance and functionality. And that might be the case when we consider whole life value, that to achieve that, we may have to invest more at the front end. We may have to invest more in capital cost terms in order to yield those benefits. And that's a tough sell for, for clients who, who have traditionally been pretty capital cost and short term focused. But value ultimately is a balance between customer satisfaction, client and end user, and the consumption of resources to actually get you there, get you to that point. Um, next slide, please. So a starting point, what do we mean by, by value creation? Just to pick up in that theme, um, it's not an easy a concept, um, but a high level definition that we could all, I think, agree on is that value creation is what best contributes to the strategic objectives of an organization. So what is it in terms of commercial and, and other objectives, private sector, public sector, policy objectives, what is it that you're trying to do as a business or an organization? And then how do you get there through that project? So the sponsor's investment in a project 
usually represent some kind of step change in achieving these strategic objectives. It's not an incremental difference, but we make a substantial, significant investment in a new project, not necessarily a construction project, it could be IT, it could be business related, um, but from our domain, from our point of view, the, um, the construction project, a new built asset, a facility, refurbishment of something is you know, what we're dealing with, and that's a means to furthering the corporate strategy of the organization. But of course, we're having to do that within, a, within budgetary and time constraints. So there's a project manager's dilemma, is how do you balance the time, cost, quality, and uh, performance variables? So the, the way that we think of a project and the way that we deal, we explain it and discuss it with the students, is that the design solution for a construction project is a response to the strategic need. And that has to satisfy a whole range of stakeholder and end users of the, of the built asset of the facility. So we need to understand clients, we need to understand stakeholders, and we need to understand their priorities, their needs, and their wants. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go through every slide and everything on the text on here in detail, but I just want to use this to illustrate how Increasingly, value, life cycle, whole life value, and sustainable whole life value permeates the whole construction process. I should correct that, the whole design, briefing, and construction process. So here we have the, the latest iteration of the RIBA plan of work, something which is um, very familiar to a lot of people in construction, been around for a long time. Um, but that's now evolving into something which really foregrounds whole life value and sustainable value. And that's in financial terms, but it's also in carbon terms, um, environmental terms, social sustainability, and waste minimization. And the whole supply chain has got a role to play in achieving that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, how do we measure value? Uh, well, picking up in this theme, it's not just about costs and revenues. Um, and this is something we, we get our students to think about in, in detail. Uh, value, value perspectives. What do we mean by value? It means different things to different people, clients and organizations. And clients themselves are, are, can be complex. They're not single unitary decision-making bodies they can represent a whole coalition of different and sometimes competing interests that nevertheless have to be explored, reconciled, understood, and incorporated into the strategic driver for the project, and then the brief for the project, and then the design solution response that meets that requirement. So what we can say is that value can only be defined in the client's own terms. It's not something that construction professionals, project managers, QSEs, or others can come along and say, you know, here is value in your terms. We have to explore that you know, with the client. Um, and a quote that I like to use with the students comes from a, a report that was published just after the, the financial crash the credit crunch, never waste a good crisis. How can the construction industry reinvent itself and bounce back? Well, part of that was about what value means to clients. Um, and a nice quote there, I think, is that clients struggle to articulate what value means to them. Too few projects develop a clear brief that defines business, social, and environmental requirements. So in short, defining value for the project investment is not straightforward, and it's the role of services like value management to actually um, help the clients articulate and, and what that actually means. So next slide, please. Um, so value management is a, a, a sort of one of the courses or, or a main or, or part of the postgraduate program um, it's a total process of enhancing value for clients 
throughout the whole um, project uh, life cycle. Uh, and we use this uh, simple pairs comparison matrix, this graphical technique to get students to, to act as clients, to act as client advisors um, in their case studies for projects and explore value. So what we're trying to do is determine and make overt, make explicit the client's project value system for any project investment. And that involves a discussion, a dialogue about all of these competing objectives. So the end result that we get to will inevitably be a compromise. Um, some, some stakeholders have perhaps more power and influence than others, but the single project investment, single um, built solution, which is a response to many and varied requirements, will be a compromise of, the, of all of these different requirements. So some of these are objective and measurable, capital cost, through life cost, uh, time. You know, we can all agree and measure what units of cost and time are. But other areas are more subjective, social sustainability, you know, politics, popularity, community, environmental impact. Um, there's other dimensions of value on there, balance sheet value. But things like future flexibility and adaptability. Yeah. What is this asset going to look like in five years' time or 10 years' time? How loose fit does it need to be? But we want to promote. More often than not, we want to promote that long-term thinking um, to understand what long-term value looks like for the client. Now, that's not necessarily about pursuing long life for the sake of it, um, just understanding what the client's time horizon is, is important. And there's some other tricky uh, dimensions of value around esteem, prestige, uh, comfort, physical, psychological comfort, less measurable, um, but nevertheless can be very important in certain buildings for certain uh, clients. Okay, so this, this helps promote that discussion about what value is for any, any project and gets the dialogue going between the stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so whole life cycle and value creation, moving on. Um, life cycle costing, whole life costing, terms which are sometimes used interchangeably, is something that's been around for a long time in the construction industry. Uh, it's part of our QS master's and undergraduate degree programs. We want to um, promote and develop life cycle costing concepts and have our students apply these on uh, graduation. So life cycle costing is perhaps a, a little bit more straightforward and it, it is a financial appraisal of capital and operating costs over a defined period of time for either the whole building or parts thereof, individual solutions, individual systems or, or products. So there's a broad understanding, awareness of life cycle costing within the QS profession in particular, but it's probably fair to say that it's still not mainstream, that it's still not being um, fully promoted and used and applied within a construction projects. But it is, I think, gaining increasing prominence within the, the whole dialogue in the context of sustainable construction. So lots of attention about sustainability, uh, net zero, uh, the climate emergency, all of these, these goals around sustainability. And life cycle costing is about financial sustainability. It's about energy efficiency. Um, so together with financial savings, there is carbon savings. So these drivers are many and varied. There's a business case to reduce costs. There is a ever tighter external environment, building regulations, government targets. And there's also more consumer awareness, shareholder expectations and societal expectations around carbon saving 
and uh, sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just very quickly on this one, continuing the theme here, uh, targets, targets are everywhere now. We've got a long-term target, global net zero internationally by 2050. It's ambitious, it's um, global. Um, there's a staging post about halving emissions by 2030. So that's a medium term. Um, so this is driving decision-making and it's driving behaviors and awareness and decision-making around um, you know, everything we do in society. But construction, of course, has got a large part to play in um, resource efficiency and sustainability. So my top bullet point there covers a whole range of things. Um, you know, sustainability, it's about technical solutions, renewables technologies, um, solar PV, ground source heat pumps, um, all the technical solutions that the supply chain and um, companies are, are developing. And the hope is it will become more, more mainstream. Um, we reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, more recycling and reuse of materials, as well as renewables technologies, high performance building fabrics, a lot of attention being paid to, to those in more recent times as a means to improving um, energy efficiency in particular. And as was mentioned earlier, we're in an era now of very volatile soaring energy costs where this is you know, really bringing to the fore the need to, to minimize through life costs, to minimize energy consumption. We've been here before, the 1970s and 1980s. We had the oil crisis, we had energy price crises. So you know, these things are, are, are cyclic. Feels a bit different now, it's a, it's a geopolitical situation, but there is a, a real driver now to, to reduce costs and to be more resource efficient. But of course, the technical challenges, they differ across, across the globe. So for us in the UK, it's about how to heat buildings efficiently and minimize uh, heat losses and reduce um, U values through high performance fabrics and so on. But of course, in the Emirates, you've got to think about, well, how do you more efficiently cool buildings and provide a, uh, an environment which um, you know, achieves a comfortable, uh, workable environment, but reduces reliance on mechanical engineering uh, and mechanical uh, ventilation and uh, air conditioning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, very briefly, just I'm running out of time, the, the, the QS and, and my background is a chartered surveyor. Uh, life cycle costing is very much part of the, the QS professional services. Um, it's a financial tool that will aid clients in decision making, but it does need to be considered within a broader value framework. We cannot just be considering capital cost and recurrent cost uh, alone, and that value framework is about both objective, more measurable facets, as well as some of these subjective and perceived uh, facets. But we do need to be more um, mainstream in our approach and our use, our application of life cycle costing, not just for financial cost, but also carbon modeling, carbon cost modeling of buildings. And this is I suggest that you know, a big challenge for industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is just to illustrate that um, value management, value engineering, and life cycle costing, as well as being embedded in the curriculum here at Heritage University, are you know, very much part and parcel of the, the QS and construction um, professional competence for chartered surveyors. Uh, next slide, please, Judy. Okay, so just lastly, um, some concluding remarks. There is increasing awareness of the need for whole life cycle decision-making, financial, um, carbon or otherwise. 
with the context of sustainability and all the attention that that's, that's having. But arguably, uh, the construction industry is conservatives, conservative. There is still a tendency for short-term uh, capital cost-driven decision-making, and that's to the detriment of optimal value for money. Um, when you do look at the whole life, when you do look to the future, things become more complicated because the future is inherently uncertain. There is risk, there is uncertainty, there is obsolescence. And there's issues of the availability and reliability of data that allows us to, as construction professionals, to pursue whole life cost modeling in the services that we provide to, to our clients. Um, more skills training, education, is, sounds rather glib to say, but you know, these things are necessary for construction professionals to provide whole life cost-based and whole life uh, decision-making services to clients. Uh, and universities can, and they do, reflect this. They should embed this whole life cycle approach into everything that runs through the, the programs, financial, environmental, and social. Um, because today's students are tomorrow's decision makers and leaders, and it is today's students who in the future will drive these things, not people like me who are um, at the latter end of their career. So thank you for your attention. I think I may have run on a little bit, but hopefully that's provided some food for thought. Uh, and I'll just conclude there and uh, hand back to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Um, certainly something which has just almost wet the appetite of what we're trying to discuss here. Um, you introduced some, some really important things. I like the fact that you mentioned about um, the term value is actually very subjective. And I took down actually what you wrote, and I'll probably summarize with this at the end of the session, but it's what best contributes to the strategic objectives of an organization. I think that's that's a really key point. Uh, so, so before we go on to discussing with our other panelists, I'd just like to ask you yourself, Dr. Graham, you mentioned about you know va the value modeling or you know modeling kind of for the whole life cycle. Um, how would that work for situations such as Hyperloop or when the Burj Khalifa was first constructed, for example? These are buildings that were just concepted of but they've never been seen in reality so so what approach would you expect that that clients would take for for um, objectives which have never been done before? so i guess with great difficulty because where things haven't been done before there is no precedent uh, there is more risk and it takes bold clients progressive clients with long-term decision making in mind to actually um you know make decisions which are in the interests of the, the very long term. Um, and you're building such as ones you mentioned, uh, iconic structures, um, going back to the, the dimensions of value where prestige, aesthetics, these kind of things, the, the design is, is, is everything. And uh, there's perhaps a tension there between uh, the architectural aspects um, and the engineering aspects and you know what what this building will be used for in five years time in, in ten years time uh, and we talk about that a lot within our curriculum risk and uncertainty and within the context of life cycle costing as well obsolescence is something which is difficult to price in okay so broadly we know we have some data about the performance characteristics of, of technical systems, materials, components. Um, and you know, they degrade over time uh, in a kind of generally understandable way. Even then that's more difficult as, we, as you look to the future and further into the future. But um, when you think about obsolescence, you think about external drivers, the economy, competition, markets, consumer behaviours, uh, fashion, um, the regulatory environment, it becomes, you know, more difficult the further ahead into the future you, you try to, to, to look. Um, 
So I don't know if that gives you an answer, Ria. Is it just throws up more issues? Well, it just shows more more issues, doesn't it? I mean, I was just thinking when you mentioned that, um, you know, you mentioned obsolescence, which is quite a negative term, I suppose. But is there any kind of positives? So do we ever factor in that actually we we expect to see some efficiencies in the future that we can't quite quantify at this stage? Yeah, I mean, obsolescence, I think it's just not necessarily a negative. It's just um, it's, it's a reality. And it's a reality where you have technological advancements. Um, so things, technology, products, IT systems will always become obsolete as the next generation comes along. Um, otherwise, you could argue, well, we haven't made progress if things don't become obsolete in, in the future. And, and I guess looking at, again, those dimensions of value, um, if we think about adaptability, flexibility, loose fit design, you know, how can we, we, we yeah. may not exactly foresee how things will change in the future, but you can perhaps design in that flexibility Excellent. and yeah. you know, you know, how Excellent. things will be used. Yeah. Agreed. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Graham. Um, one of the points that was mentioned in your presentation is actually the, I think the challenge that most of us face in the industry, and that's actually um, clients traditionally thinking more capex upfront construction type orientation rather than thinking about the whole life cycle as such. So I want to give this question to Darren actually. Um, how how do we get clients to start thinking about a whole life cycle approach? And you know. Because we know, for example, that it may result in actually an OPEX reduction over a long term, but it might mean that you're going to have to spend a little bit more at the beginning to get that efficiency saving later. So over to you, Darren. Thank you, Rias. Um, I think as Graham, Dr. Graham's touched on uh, at length in, in his presentation, value is very subjective. Uh, I think one of the first things we need to do with our clients and with our stakeholders is help them define what value means to them. Or what, what cost they're willing to spend as an uplift for the particular value. And, and value is very much subjective. It could be uh, a reputation benefit for an organization like Graham touched on or uh, a time scale to, to market. They, they might have a really pressing need to, to be on site within a year and, and complete for, for a data center, for example. And in, in that case, value in terms of the whole life cycle is probably less so because they need that return on investment. And it's trying to educate our clients and empower them to make the right decisions and, and give enough time to themselves and to the design team to, to really engineer and get, give proper life cycle analyses of the decisions they make in concept. Um, I think the strategic brief talking to the, the Reva plan of work, stage zero and stage one it is where value management should be happening. And I think we find, especially in this region and, and maybe in, in the UK and, and elsewhere that it's more stage three and four, it's a value engineering process rather than a value management process. And at that stage, the strategic decision is made, the budget is signed off. And to try and go back to upper management within, within an organization and unlock some more funds for, for, for some good innovation it is gonna be difficult. And, and I think that's where we all need to from academia to, to professionals, educate and work with our clients, give enough time to everyone within the process. And I'm from a design background, so time's always good for us to have and to really um, consult and give the clients the best advice. But it, it's not just from a selfish perspective. It's the, these, these building assets are gonna live with us for 60 years or more, hopefully longer. And okay, you can put in a system that's obsolete after 25 years and make sure you've got the, accessibility to the plant so that you're not pulling down elements that are fully functional and you, you've got a, a, a safe plan of work that you know they're going to be replaced have a plan for that do it as seamlessly as possible use the latest technology in 25 years and it's not a surprise I, I think too often in this region flexibility is not accounted for ceilings are pulled down to to replace a fankel unit and and the embodied carbon and the cost of that it is quite ridiculous when if you'd have put in a, a sensible access strategy, it would be a much more cost-effective, quick solution, less wastage, and just inherently a more sustainable solution overall. So yeah, to, just to kind of finish, empower and educate um, our clients and, and really work with them. Yeah, 
but I think you're right. I think we can all agree to that. Um, you mentioned about technology and innovation. One of the big buzzwords at the moment is digital twins. Um, you know, and and when we talk about digital twins, it's not just having a 3D BIM model of what you've constructed, but it's about how you can replicate and simulate, in fact, different interactions that would occur in a building or in a system. The idea being, from my understanding, you know, to, to get some energy optimization and better usage out of that building. So I'll give this question to Ahan, uh, and Darren, please do provide your thoughts as well, because I think you will have different uh, perspectives on this, but what role does digital twins and any kind of subsequent energy optimization how does this link to a whole, whole life cycle viewpoint? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Riaz, Mr. Che. Um, I, I just would like to, I think, touch on um, the supply chain point of view and how critical it is, especially digital twin for the construction of material um, in, the, in the global level and also in the regional level as well, because um, I think we were all um, heavily shaken <laughs> in terms of trust in, in, in safety critical products, uh, which has been hit by some sort of fake data scandals and major disasters, as you can um, recall quite easily in Morande bridge collapse in Florida, pedestrian flyover bridge collapse, and even in Grenfell Tower, um, the fire and so on. There are a lot of things, um, I mean, uh, needs to be uh, revisited and re reviewed and checked from scratch really. So there are a lot of things happening right now in the UK. And you know the building safety bill, uh, and now it's an act. Now there are a lot of other supportive legislations will come into force, and etc. So I'm, I'm, I just wanted to. I, I, I prefer to start from this because um, obviously this is entirely and quite significant the link with the digital approach, and we know how how critical and how important it is the digitalization in the construction industry from the from the construction product uh, point of view and how digitalization can uh, really contribute into, into transparency and more provenance data availability is going to be the key part. Uh, from our angle, uh, from, from a conformity assessment body um, uh, specialized in steel supply chain, I think it is a lot. And so that's why we believe um, the digital transformation is 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 one of the core elements, and 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 uh, it's it's definitely going to require quite a lot of investments in people, you know, the processes and and technologies, uh, especially. So it's not a, an easy game. It's going to take quite a lot of time, but um, it, uh, we've been um, actively engaging uh, quite a lot of stakeholders um, in nationally in the UK and internationally as well. Right now in in, in UAE, we've got some some quite a, um, an interesting interaction right now going on from, from government level as well. So uh, I think um, this is going to be uh, one of the key area, uh, first of all, to understand what it is really available um, in, in the regional um, sort of market in terms of the constructional material and how it can be digitally um, transformed into, um, into the model itself and how uh, institutions like ourselves and like SESC, for example, can contribute into these innovative methods and methodologies uh, to provide more and more from the designer point of view. I think this is the area. Um, our role is obviously plugging in um, uh, the available um, 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 uh, and verified, third party verified, audited and inspected conformity assessed uh, product data into this digital network. That's our duty. That's something we've been really uh, trying to be heavily working on. And um, it needs um, uh, more um, initiatives to get involved. Obviously, it's just a, a big journey. And, and, and But I'm really happy to share at the, at the second part of the, uh, obviously, um, the panel discussions. I'd like to also link it with how it is possible, technically possible to link with the net zero uh, journey uh, and what is re really the benefit we can get it um, from this sure. digital so connected. I'm going to stop you there, Ehan, because yeah. we're going to come to that shortly. Yes, yes. Uh, Darren, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think to kind of pick up where Ehan left off, the carbon sustainability and safety uh, are obviously, safety being everyone should be focusing on that as our number one priority and everything else is secondary. That embodied carbon, we're, we're working with developers in the region to try and work with them to understand their roadmap to the 50% the reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And 
as part of that, we need the supply chain and, and all of the stakeholders within that to really step up to the table and share with us the embodied carbon of the materials because that goes into that value creation analyses. And if we consider the prospect of carbon tax being introduced in the future, whether it be globally or locally, that's a, another capital cost driver for projects. So you can start really understanding the value of the embodied carbon, which we should all be aspiring to reduce anyway. And, and then putting that into the digital twin and into the digital modeling side, it allows us to educate our clients, like I said, and empower them. We're working with one currently that we are essentially giving them a shopping list and saying this is the uplifting investment, but here's the return on investment when it comes to capital cost, energy, carbon offset over the life cycle. So it, it's really um, exciting and encouraging to see that the supply chain from a steel perspective, which isn't my specialism, it, it is already moving in that direction. And I think in terms of embodied carbon, building structures is the, the, the biggest driver for sure. Um, and, and if you talk from an engineering and energy perspective, the digital twin from our perspective is a very useful tool to validate and calibrate what we, um, what assumptions and, and considerations we make in our design process. It, it's all well and good using rule of thumb uh, and, and other things during our design for the life cycle analysis. But if the building doesn't perform like that in reality, there's something wrong with the rule of thumb or the building isn't operating correctly. And that, that digital twin can be used to benchmark across similar assets from one developer, across similar assets from a governmental level or a national level. And digital twins are a plethora or, or a huge rep repository of data that you could start putting machine learning models to in future, um, giving context to it and really closing the loop when it comes to academia, back into energy, engineering, construction and making the correct decisions earlier on and, and really moving the supply chain forward. How about that? Thank you, Darren. Um, okay, Ahan, back to you. So you, we've already touched on it. You know, we've seen that the UAE and globally, the, the, we've, we've all got the commitments now to a 2050 carbon net zero target. But look, considering that back to the topic at hand here, uh, whole life cycle. So how, how do we see this going, going to have an impact on design, procurement, through to construction and operation? How do we see the net zero target having an influence? Yeah, I think it's a, it's. Um, I I just I would prefer to start about the the availability of the credible information first of all. What exactly available in the marketplace and uh, how we can access them? I just shared a link in the chat box, uh, obviously, uh, for anyone who would like to know what's really happening from the construction and steel supply chain point of view. What is the GWP value, for example, uh, for, for, for steel producers? We've been implementing a model since, I think, during the last uh, 12 years right now. And then uh, quite a lot of active interest, really, from the region, from especially from UAE. And we got about um, quite a considerable credible data already reviewed and studied and then EPD reported, independently verified EPD reported. They're all available in the link. So if they can select uh, the, the major producers in the region, Emirates, Canaris, uh, Jinda, whoever the other producers in the region, I'm talking about the major um, supply chain, they can access it. And um, so they can find out um, quite quickly that uh, credible information and they can use it from the designer point of view, from the contractor point of view. If you've got a project, let's say green building rated and you would like to make sure that you are really secure from the, from the construction material point of view, steel is one of the key one. So you just want to know where we are, what, what, what exactly I'm talking about in terms of the GWP value for the material I'm using. So this is kind of all available and UAE is kind of ahead of the game compared to the other GCC nations. They already realized it quite some time ago. I'm very proud of it, really. And um, so uh, the recognition level is, is quite high. And they already understood why it is very important to be a part of this um, sort of change. And they made it quite clear and they disclosed this information. So anyone who wants to know what it is really, uh, for example, the GWP value, um, uh, from, from the uh, local steel manufacturing point of view, it's available. It's accessible. Right. So um, Dr. Karima has already shared that on the chat. So um, yeah. all the attendees, feel free to have a look. Um, just very quickly, conscious of time, uh, Dr. Graham, do, do you have any, any viewpoints based on your um, academic research or what you're teaching to your students? 
Yeah, I'm I beg your pardon, yeah, I was having some problems there. Um, in a particular issue there, what... Um, well, just, you know, how, how are we going to... Um, we've got a carbon net zero target, but where, where do you see it having the most impact on the whole life cycle? Where, where would you see it? Is it all the way through or is it in a particular element? Would it be in design and procurement? How do you see this playing yeah, out? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I think my own view is in picking up an, an earlier theme and also what, what Darren mentioned is that for too often decisions that are made are almost too late and retrospectively. Um, so for example, value engineering, when that happens, it tends to be too late in the design process to make meaningful change. And often it's little more than cost cutting um, termed up as value engineering. So, so we have to start thinking about it at stage zero. It has to really be driving decisions that are made um, from the strategic project brief through to the, the construction project brief and the, the, the technical design. But you know, it is a the, yeah. there's lots of guidance, there is more awareness, um, but it does take behavioral change. It will take the, the carrot and the stick as well for you know, in terms of regulatory compliance to actually get to, to make this a business imperative. So okay. you know, it does there's no sing, there's no single silver bullet, I'm afraid. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so we have, thankfully, uh, and thank you to, to the panelists here, um, we, we've got quite a few questions. So we've got about 10 minutes to go through some of these questions. Um, so let's let's go through and we'll just choose a couple here and we'll see what we can do. Um, one of our attendees has asked, what incentives are there for clients and contractors to focus on social value creation, especially in the current market conditions? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I recently wrote a LinkedIn article that actually talked very similar about that point in, in the fact that I, I'm a firm believer in contractually incentivizing everyone to do these kind of things. So um, I'll start off with Darren, if you've seen it in the industry, uh, and then we'll, we'll hand over to Graham if we've got any further follow up. That. Yeah, sure. Um, I think value to your assets if you're a developer or operating offices. I think the, the focus recently is on sustainability and wellness. And I think that is inherently social value. It, it's giving back to, to the client, the built environment, and, and our children and their children uh, moving forward that we're trying to leave a better built environment that we can interact with. Um, wellness, uh, you've got the well accreditation, lead accreditation, and so on and so forth. By having that accreditation, your asset is more valuable as well for, for a lot of landlords and developers. So there's a reward element to it that people want to be in healthier buildings, more well buildings that their staff, the, the people living in them have got a good environment. They've got plenty of fresh air. They've got the biophilia element they can interact with. Um, the, the, the peers in good environment. So I think that that's where the incentive is, is the market is moving there. People don't want to stay in the status quo, normal offices where they're kind of arranged like a cattle market or, or similar, and it, it's quite a stale environment. So I think that's where I see the incentives from the, the, the corporate real estate that we work with from the, the base build design. It, it's sustainability and wellness is at the core of pretty much everything we do now. And it's great to see our clients move in there. Agreed. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Graham, is, is any 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 thoughts on you? I mean, how, how do we how do we incentivize the contractors to focus on this? Is it a simple case of actually just getting the clients to instruct it in the contract? And never, you know, inevitably you will find that the contractors will have to sign up to it because it's in the contract. You're nodding, so I'm assuming you're agreeing with me. Although you're on mute. I beg your pardon, that's me back now. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, contractors are commercial organisations. Um, they make commercial decisions. And, and I think reflecting the requirement for um, community benefits and for social, socially responsible 
developments and construction within the, the contract is a powerful means to actually do that. The public sector um, contracts require that to a certain extent here in the UK. So for example, contractors, when they tender, they need to show that they will invest in say apprenticeships and training opportunities, um, benefit the local community. So it's about the construction process as well and what that will bring to the, the, the local authority, the local area, as well as re reflected in the design solution and the operational phase as well in terms of um, placemaking and uh, you know, environments which are, which are nice to have. And you know, the, the, the planning authorities um, can you know, obviously do have a role there in only uh, offering planning consent where contractors and developers will provide these uh, socially responsible um, yeah, developments, but there will always, I guess, be a tension between compliance, social responsibility, and the need for uh, for for profit and for competitive gain. Understood. Thank you, Graham. I think that's a very good point. It's not just a contractual; it's a legislative effort that's needed as well to 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 get this going. Um, so, Aham, one of the questions that we've got here is you know um how can we let's try and reword this what why, why do we see whole life costing not widely practiced in construction uh, and i've given this question to you because perhaps you, you've got some information or insights where you could argue that we do see it just probably not as advertised as much as we think it is I think um, incentivizing is the key um, sort of the word over here. We just need to understand because we've been talking uh, for this uh, quite some time from the, again, from the um, steel industry supply chain point of view, I'm just, uh, I can talk um, obviously um, since our stakeholders are kind of more keen on what exactly can be done, how they can perform better and how they can kind of understand those initiatives really and align themselves in the same way. And uh, obviously when we have initially introduced our sustainability scheme, which is including um, EPD reporting, independent and verified EPD reporting, and also those um, uh, the, the, the social value um, and, and also in complying, how the supply chain complies with social value and so on. And, and measuring it and, and start kind of um, confidently um, certifying against those uh, KPIs set uh, to the industry was a big, massive challenge. And people don't understand why they do need it. And then obviously where they are going to use it and what it is really going to bring them compared to the cost of the whole process and et cetera, because that was not really um, sort of um, a free services that you you can get benefit right now. So it's 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 a kind of a, a, the cost benefit analysis, really. We, we've been questioned a lot in the very beginning. Uh, now, when they have started um, eight, uh, nine years ago, I'm even talking about the local manufacturers in the region, they, they get the benefit of being the early bird, the early adopters. Now they are um, not only uh, producing for the region and complying with these uh, green building regulations and requirements and so on. They are also exporting right now for the other part of the world where those initiatives are really uh, quite carefully looked after, like um, Singapore, for example, Hong Kong, and um, uh, especially JLL now, uh, we have been in communications with the Hong Kong office from, uh, from, from JLL group and they're understanding what exactly they can do and, and how they can sort of benefit and drive the supply chain, especially the steel uh, construction of steel supply chain sort of it and to to meet their expectations and so on so i think um if you early engage with them they would understand if you explain them properly and what it is really going to happen in the near future and they will understand and they will start working uh, right away and because they can see that this is coming and there's no way out so they need to align it they need to work hard to just to comply with these requirements and make sure uh, sort of their product are preferred in, in this competitive environment. I think this is the key thing. The buyer's uh, interest in, in dragging their attention, why they have to choose, why they need to choose uh, more sustainable material, for example, is going to all um, sort of be more detailed, I think, considered in, in the decision-making side of it, if it makes sense. Okay. Okay, okay so we'll 
we are, I apologize, there, there, there is quite a few questions here. So we'll just take one final one. Um, let's choose one for Darren, I think. Given the rate of change of in-building technology and demand for buildings to be increasingly smart, how do you think we can best factor this into the design and construction process to create value for occupants now whilst making buildings future-proof? Thank you, Riaz, a, a difficult one to try, to try and answer. I, I think like I touched on before in terms of the flexibility and I think Graham um, stressed on the adaptability in terms of value that the buildings, we shouldn't try and think of them as solved from day one, that they should be flexible, adaptable, that, that there's enough space in the ceilings, there's enough space in the risers and that we can kind of substitute alternative equipment into a similar space and change the function of the space, or if you're not quite certain on the final uh, technology if in three or four years when your building's finishing, be a bit more passive in your design solutions and maybe put it as part of the tender process with contractors that you might need to put in 5G. I, I worked on a mall uh, a few years ago that during the design, it was a 4G IT uh, data network. Whilst it was being constructed, 5G was the new standard. So there was retrospective design changes for that. And if there was a bit of foresight and a bit of additional money spent up front, slightly oversizing the containment and so on and so forth, that you could have just taken that in your stride. And I think it's, again, that, that CapEx cost driving the initial spend down actually costs you more in the long run because you have to make retrospective change, pull ceilings down, take up car parking spaces in the car park for additional rooms. And that, that's a nightmare, especially in an operational um, arena. So build in flexibility, understand your building is not finished from day one. It's a living, breathing thing that is going to grow with us as, as we move forward. Inherent kind of capacity, future capacity is basically what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to summarise here and I just want to thank all, all the participants and actually all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through to the end. But in summary, when we're talking, my own views of what I've come collected here over the last hour is value. It can mean many different things to different people, but the best summary of it is what's, what best contributes to the strategic objectives of an organization. Um, when we're talking about digital transformation, yes, it will be critical to success, uh, but we just need to make sure we understand what is being planned to be able to validate that. And actually it goes back to Darren's point, which was, the benefit of the digital twins is is actually the ability in the future for, for benchmarking and validation of our assumptions in the first place uh, and i think that will help the whole life cycle from actually academia to to industry um and the last point was we need time needed to make the right decisions and if we were looking at a reba life cycle stage zero and one would be the most appropriate place so early upfront engagement needs to be there flexibility needs to be accounted for so i'd like to thank everyone and i'll hand over to dr karima thank you so much riaz and uh, i know it's not easy to tackle this subject in in one hour uh, thank you all to uh, for all our speakers for such an informative and interesting discussion and uh, I would like to thank also our audience for their participation and uh, interaction. Uh, so please note that today's recording will be shared with you uh, very soon. Uh, you can also find all our webinar recordings on SESC YouTube channel. Uh, please feel free to scan this QR code to access it, or you can also find the link on the chat. Um, our next webinar is titled The Potential of BIM for Measuring and Enhancing Productivity in the Construction Industry. And of course, more details will be communicated to you uh, in due course. Please stay tuned. This then concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>